Okay, you can you can start. Yeah, I'll, I'll just start. Hey, uh, how's it going, everybody? Um, Eric, so I'm going to be talking about uh, adaptive networks um, and COVID policy. So I've been working with Peter, Tyler, Herbert, uh, Gabrielle. And so I'm going to talk for the first part of this about the paper, Contact Networks Structured by Sex Underpin Sex-Specific Epidemiology of Infection uh, by Silk et al. And then Gabrielle is going to talk about COVID policy, specifically based on this Harvard White Paper of When Can We Go Out? Evaluating Policy Paradigms for Responding to the COVID-19 Threat. Yeah, so again, presentation overview. First, I'm going to talk about uh, the case study from the paper I mentioned, which is, it's a case study in how a complex social network uh, in an animal population changes over time with some results specific to um, infection of a specific bacteria uh, for tuberculosis. Uh, and then Gabriel is going to talk about COVID policy, uh, and then we'll summarize a little bit. So. The paper I'm talking about, again, is by Silk et al. It's about uh, how structured groups, how animal populations structured by sex change seasonally and any implications of that for disease spread. Uh, so this example is in badgers. Um, the bacteria is the M. bovis bacteria, which results in bovine tuberculosis. And so in this picture right here, uh, what you see, it's called a um, multi-layer network. Um, the red circle are female badgers, blue circles male badgers, uh, and then they're grouped into different social networks, uh, different communities, and there are links between the communities and these evolve and change over time. So again, the focus here is to pick out the variable of sex, look at how when we structure the networks by this variable, how that changes seasonally, and any impact it has on disease spread, uh, through testing for this bovine TB germ. So the way the data was generated for this study uh, was the use of proximity tags on 24 male, 27 female badgers in a population in the UK. Uh, total population of individuals was between 134 to 01. The data was logged from June 2009 to May 2010. And a contact was uh, binary considered to happen when two badgers that were tagged came within 0.64 plus or minus 0.4 meters of each other. And then a contact would end when they were out of detection for more than 30 seconds. Uh, specific to this study, so they had to um, contact the bat, they had to trap the badgers to test them for this M. bovis germ, and they excluded contact events pre and post. Uh, these trappings, assuming that the behavior would be different uh, for the animal when they're being trapped, and then also uh, for a short period after. So the study was split into discrete time periods, uh, seasons from June to August, September to November, December to February, and then March to May. And again, so networks were constructed for male-to-male -male contacts, female-to-female -female contacts, in between sex interactions. And these are weighted networks, and they're weighted by the duration of contact. So when individuals come into contact with each other, it starts logging the amount of time uh, that this contact lasts. Individuals were deemed positive or infectious if they ever tested positive for the M. bovis um, bacteria during the study period, and else they were susceptible. At the end of the period, there were 27 infectious badgers, 24 susceptible. So the way the network structure was determined was, uh, kind of three, three different parts. So first, individuals were assigned to a community via the iGraph community detection algorithm um, based off this paper here, Cesarity and Nepuz, or sorry, I can't pronounce the last name. But so this, um, they were assigned to these social groups via this community detection algorithm based on their contact data. And I just wanna say that this was for the total study period contact data. Then with each, within each season, two exponential random graph models were constructed. One was defined on shared set usage, so sharing the same burrow. And the idea is to see if badgers that are in close spatial proximity to each other uh, whenever they use their burrows are, have disproportionately higher context than otherwise would be expected, or whether the badgers the groupings that were defined based on the community detection algorithm using the all steady period contact data 
um, would have more higher weighted context than expected. So the interpreting of these ERGM models is that the sign of model estimates is positive. The given network has more edge weights than expected, negative if less. And the magnitude of these estimates provide information on the strength of an effect. And so doing one for spatial and one for the social groupings defined in step one uh, is just a way to compare what is a more natural, what is a better grouping to explain the contact data that the study found. Oh, moving on. So yeah, this uh, community detection algorithm, just put the slide up here for completeness, uh, but it's a multi-step process uh, from this paper by Blondel et al. So assume each vertex is their own community. You reassign each node to the community that maximizes the modularity score, and then you merge communities from the prior step to maximize the modularity score, and you keep doing this until you can't merge anymore. Um, and then I posted, put the modularity score down below. Uh, and so M is the total number, um, the sum of the total weights um, in your graph. AIJ is the weight from vertex I, AIJ, so IJ is an edge. Um, so right, you're weighting, you want to make this score higher. So that means you want to, you want to balance, um, including things that are highly weighted with each other but you can't just add everything that's highly weighted that's you can't just add all edges right you can't put everything in one community because then the score will be lower because of this kij times kj over 2m term uh where that's the sum of the weights going out from node i sum of the weights going out from node j um and then you're multiplying this by a delta of cicj where CIG, CJ refer to the types. So that would be the groupings if you're in social group I versus social group J, for example, or spatial group I versus spatial group J. Uh, then ERGM models uh, from a paper, Christie Exponential Family Random Graph Models, uh, 2012. And so it's a way to show how the strength of ties is mediated, again, by things like the group structure on weighted networks. So the results uh, for the study are posted here. And so what these are, are the model effects or best fit model effects um, for male, for the different social networks. So for male, male, female, female, and between sex, uh, given each season. Um, and then there are some patterns here. You see that there's more variability in the um, male, male uh, within group effects. And so these are positive, so saying that social groups or spatial groups within males lead to a higher number of contacts than between these groups. And again, the groups defined in the steps in the prior slide. Uh, so you see some sex specific patterns, namely that with the female female groupings, there is a consistent uh, pattern in which the social groups that were defined are less informative than the uh, spatial groups. Um, and that's true for each season, though there is also some wide variability in the data. Uh, and then for males, for the male-male contact networks, you see that uh, you see that the um, social groups for the first term, for the summer, are more informative, but there is wide overlap in the uh, estimates in the data. Um, and then for autumn, winter, spring, they're approximately equal, but there's not the same bias that you see for the female data. So I think the takeaway from this is that there is wide uncertainty in the data. They did show that there are sex specific patterns that seem to differ um, in the contact networks between male, males, female, female, between sex, uh, as well as that it varies seasonally. Uh, so going to the next slide. Um, so what this graph is showing, the most important takeaway from this slide is picture C. So what this is showing is the impact of whether you're in, you've tested positive for an infection uh, for M. bovis on the strength of uh, between network contacts. So these model estimates are positive for male male, um, between sex and for females. And what this is indicating is that individuals that test positive do have uh, hi hi Eric. Uh, I think you have run out of time. So you were supposed to present seven minutes and leave three minutes for questions. You're already ten minutes in. 
So uh, I'll give you like maybe. Yeah, I'll, I'll finish up. Really. So the, 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 the point from this slide is just that, um, yeah, sorry for mistiming, but the point from this slide is that individuals that test positive for the infection do have higher uh, model estimates for between social contacts, uh, between network contacts, indicating that indicating that you know there's an interplay between social behavior between interacting with various groups and infection status um it's statistically significant for a male male and between sex uh but not for um female female but it is still the average is still positive for female female also uh so yeah if gabriel can uh quickly talk about policy no i you guys are out of time um, yeah, apology. 11 minutes uh so yeah we can keep the questions for the end we have like five to ten minutes in the end uh so next group can you please uh, um raise your hand so that i can sh you can get shared screen okay uh, can you raise your hand again i think i yeah got you yeah now i can share your screen So I'm I'm not going to be talking the whole time, but I will be sharing the screen. Okay. The other people in the group, can you please raise your hand so I can unmute you guys? You see that? Okay. Yeah. Um, people, other people in the group, please raise your hand so I can unmute you. Yeah, we can start. Okay, so my name's Owen. Um, I'm going to be sharing my screen, but I'm working on this project uh, with Weyran, Lewis, Jonathan, and Betsy, and we're calling it Modeling the Effect of Mobility Patterns on mm. Epidemics. Um, it's kind of cool. We just listened to Sam's talk about a similar project, and I think we're going to probably have a lot to take away from that talk moving forward, but we've sort of been approaching the same ideas of like what, what happens when you start to model different kinds of movement patterns in a population. Um, so we've been making some stochastic spatial models to quantify the effects of public health measures on disease dynamics. And I think Weyran or Lewis is gonna take the, um, the first couple slides. So go for it. Are they, are they here? Lewis, do you wanna start with this one? Hi. Hi, everyone. Oh, yeah, excuse? we can hear you. We can hear you. Oh, you can hear me. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I. Okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So the basic basic motivation is that uh, we want to build an uh, agent based model within patch or within pattern um, uh, 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 within a city, which uh, incorporate different mobility patterns. And that's why uh, the uh, our, the name of our group is called COVID Diffusion because it talks about diffusion or random walks that uh, captures different mobility patterns uh, within a patch or a city. And we want to build a multi-level network. So uh, it's a stochastic spatial model. Yes, the next yeah. stochastic spatial models uh, uh, that's capture different mobility patterns within cities um, and also a migration pattern between different cities. And we want to impose different uh, public health measures to tune the parameters and evaluate and quantify the effectiveness of various uh, social policy responses. So it is a sort of a hybrid model where we have a uh, agent-based uh, SIR models within cities uh, together with migration. Um, maybe the next slide, please. Thanks. And then maybe first we talk about, uh, let me give you the within city spatial model setup. So each city or region is a domain. We implement in a two-dimensional domain with some central lo locations that will attract uh, uh, people. And there are N agents within each city, uh, each having a type together with a spatial location. So we here uh, simplify to look at only SIR model. So each agent will have one of the three types to get with a spatial location. The independent motion of each agent 
is a random walk or diffusion or abnormal diffusion like a Navi flight, so a long range jump process. And uh, together with some uh, social distancing measure, for example, a repulsion between different uh, agents. And we also impose disease transmission, which is a stochastic version of an SIR model with transmission rate beta and recovery, recovery rate gamma. So basically, if an S person is close to an I person for a long enough time, then he or she will have a higher probability of being infected. That means changing her type from S to I. Together, we also look at spatial accumulation, uh, cumulative effect. Yeah, basically that's the, the same as what I just mentioned. So this is within city spatial dynamics. Uh, but on top of that, we couple this with between city migrations, and that's in the next slide. Uh, so in the next slide, we briefly talk about basically between cities, uh, agents will migrate, will travel, um, and, and coupled with the within city dynamics that I talked about in the previous slides. And then in the next slides, I will talk about uh, uh, a little bit more detail, uh, the role mm. of the central locations within each city. So we assume that each city has several central locations, for example, supermarket, hospital, stores, um, shopping malls. Um, and individuals will explore new stores with a certain probability here we call PI, which is inversely proportional to the number of visited sites. And then with the complement probability one minus PI, the person will revisit uh, her, uh, his old store, uh, one of the old store that he or she had visited before. And that probability will be directly proportional to how many times he or she have already visited that store. And yes, then the, the next slide will be the simulation design maybe. Uh, um, yeah, I'm gonna talk about this slide again. <laughs> so, um, so basically what we've been doing is as we've been kind of going through these um, ideas of how agents are going to move differently, we've been iter iteratively designing and implementing uh, kind of a SIR agent based model in Python to simulate uh, agents moving with these sort of patterns. So um, it started off as just like, you know, agents can have a susceptible infected or recovered state and move through a city space following just the 2D random walk pattern that Lewis was talking about. Um, and at every time step, they'll form edges with their neighbors. And then as Lewis was again saying, with a uh, probability beta, they'll transmit an infection or not. Um, and then one of the things we've been kind of developing over time is this idea that uh, within a city, agents can have a, a certain kind of restricted movement policy that's applied to them. And so we've been adding that to the simulation to kind of see what results we get. So um, it started off as, I mean, as I was saying, it's a Python model and uh, there's this, this idea that um, there's different kinds of central locations that um, an agent can have. And we wanted to model what it would look like if an agent uh, visited each of these central locations with a different probability. So like in a central worker kind of world, there might be a higher probability that you visit work than, um, than normal. And in a lockdown world, there might be a higher probability that you stay home than normal. So if we apply these different kinds of location policies to the agent's movement, then they might visit those different kinds of central locations with um, different kinds of probabilities, and then maybe it'll kind of affect the dynamics. So one of the things we did to assign central locations was we used the Poisson point process to pick a bunch of places on a map um, that would be locations, and then put them in these Voronoi diagrams to kind of like design a space around a location that an agent might be in. And if an agent fell in that space, they would go visit that central location more likely than other ones. So we've been kind of simulating that a couple times and we have a few results of what it looks like um, when you, so we, this is when you have a kind of a more standard, like people are going to work, going home kind of model. And then you can kind of see preliminary impact on if they stay home more often that you can kind of see the curve start to flatten. Uh, this data is pretty, pretty recent that we've, we've generated. And it's like, we're kind of still iterating on what the model looks like and how many parameters it uses, but we're just encouraged to see some curves that look basically like what we're supposed to be expecting. Um, and then maybe Jonathan or Betsy, do you want to end it or should I just end it? Since we're almost out of time. I guess I'll just finish. Um, so the things we want to continue are um, expanding the simulation we've got working to accommodate this migration that Lewis is talking about between um, 
one city and another. Uh, we want to continue formulating the dynamics of the spatial model to kind of write this stuff down and maybe write a paper about it and then incorporate this idea that Sam was talking about today of like if an infection is in one place and leaves a trace behind and if another agent kind of comes through and picks that trace up and gets infected by not a, an individual but by just like the lingering infection. Uh, that's us. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation. And also the previous group, uh, I'm sorry I had to cut you short, uh, but you had exceeded time. Thank you both for the amazing presentation. If anybody has a question, uh, you have about a minute. You can go ahead. Should I stop sharing or uh, I guess yeah, I'll just- Yeah, you can stop sharing. Right. And I think somebody had a question about how is the restrictive movement policy of each agent parameterized? Um, so those, those parameters right now is just like kind of, me making an estimate like what would this look like kind of from a just like a starting point standpoint what i'd like to do is get um kind of real values for like what we're observing in in the world and kind of plug those into those location policies but um for right now it's just like let's imagine a world where you can only move home if you fall in under this probability and then you when you do you stay in that place thank you thank you cool. so much Thanks. Let's Let's go to the next group. <clears throat> Hi, can you hear me? I will share my screen now. Um, can everybody hear me? I just want to make sure. Yes. yes. Perfect. Um, all right, we are the Sancho Group. I, uh, I'm Benji Zussman. I couldn't change my name in the, uh, the corner chat box, so that's me. Um, I'll jump right into it so we can stay under seven minutes, OK? Uh, our, our project is basically trying to capture the heterogeneity that I think a lot of us are interested in. Um, and uh, to do this in a smaller population using a hospital in northern Florida as our case study site. Uh, the goal is to build a model primarily, and then uh, we're attempting to get data that we could validate it against uh, at the end. Uh, I think this is pretty similar to some of the things that Samsar Scarpino mentioned uh, that one of his students did earlier on in his slides with the uh, extended SEIR model. Um, and the contact surfaces, plastics and metals. Um, we are doing kind of an extended variation of that with a little bit of different modeling, okay? So uh, I'll go to the chart, uh, to the talk on these six points, starting with um, heterogeneity in the hospital. This is a pretty great graphic from a paper that modeled uh, the hospital uh, as divided into four different classes of healthcare workers. We are using that same conception for our paper. The colors correspond to different healthcare workers. And as you see, there's patient care areas, non-patient care areas, and mixed. Um, we are gonna focus here on patient care areas. If you blow up that graphic in the upper left, you get this one, which is uh, mirrors the divisions of how we are conceptualizing the classes in our model for the hospital, uh, namely physicians, who are this uh, cyan area down here with the yellow dots being patient care areas like uh, patient floors, emergency rooms, ICUs. Uh, and then the blue dots here are the nurses. And then we're splitting people up into admin and kind of other. Uh, the second part of our project is basically extending the compartment model. Uh, we, we started with the classic SEIR, which is I think what that paper uh, that Sam Scarpino's student did. We uh, uh, also decomposed the inf infectious compartment into asymptomatic and symptomatic, symptomatic explicitly. Um, and then what we also are doing is adopting an omega component uh, from a paper by Britain, which I have cited at the end, uh, which allows us to tune specifically the um, adaptive rewiring parameter. So uh, how, how uh, S's might rewire away from, from E's and I's. Um, there, th these are the parameters that we're using in our model as far as latent period, infectious period taken from various papers, uh, uh, primarily the Lee paper in science and, and, and two others. Uh, and this asymptomatic infectious compartment two days seems to be the consensus in the literature, which is what we're using. 
Um, as far as the adaptive rewiring, this is just an image to sort of give a sense of what we mean. Um, I've added uh, the compartments that we're going to be using here. So not all of these red dots are the same. Some of these are I, I subset A for asymptomatic, and some of them are symptomatic. And uh, varying this omega for, for the rewiring rate and then alpha for the reconnection probability will, I think, be pretty interesting, which we haven't quite incorporated into the model yet, but it'll be interesting to see uh, exactly when adaptive rewiring is actually preventive or when it, it works against you because of lack of information between parties. In the, particularly in the hospital, there's a very strong central broadcast signal in terms of them sending out emails and having all of the healthcare workers. Uh, I should say we're focusing primarily on healthcare workers in here, although our total N includes patients as well. But there's a very strong central signal um, letting people know uh, uh, about intervention policies, social distancing, PPE use. Um, the, the, the one thing that we're really doing uh, to the model that, we've, that we existed to it, found in the paper analytically is varying this omega rewiring, um, <clears throat> rewiring rate as a function of the symptomatic infectious population. Um, we are working through those results now. I, I'm going to not go through every detail on this slide, but you can see the each rewiring rate between edges, SE, a s symptomatic away from infectious asymptomatic, symptomatic away from infectious symptomatic. It, this becomes uh, a, a little bit overwhelming. Uh, our model, I think the interesting one might be the, the omega I sub A, I sub S, where infectious asymptomatic rewires away from, uh, sorry, this is a typo, it should be rewires away from infectious symptomatic, um, uh, thinking that they are actually not, uh, not infected and then they rewire back the susceptible and it worsens the problem. Um, these are analytical results. This is not actually our system of equations. This is the, the SEIR gamma model from the Britain paper. We have yet, we are working right now on <laughs> uh, uh, doing triple closures on a lot of these new pair approximations after we've introduced the new I subset A compartment and uh, making uh, omega function of time. So we have a lot of moments to be closing. Uh, that'll be next week. This is the hospital that we're going to be using as our model for the agent-based version of this in MISA. It's about a thousand bed hospital, N of 3,000. Um, this uh, right here I just highlighted in red is the emergency room, for example, this three. And down here on the left, you can see that's where it is in the context of this, this photo. Um, we will also be doing a kind of top-down version to match up with our bottom-up analytical version, and we'll be using an ergom approach for that in using the EPI model R package. We've designed a survey, and you can see some of the questions here. Uh, 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 Egocentric network survey to ask people about their duration of contacts, their type of contacts, and the length of the contacts. And then we also have some snowball survey sample questions in there as well. Um, and uh, it, finally, what we're hoping to do is uh, kind of see where the ergom and the uh, analytical an agent-based model approach meet in the middle and inform uh, them with the data from the survey and hopefully in the future data which we will get on uh, co-location using FOB key access throughout the hospital. The various units have that and uh, computer logins as well. The IRB application is pending and that is where we are right now. We are Sancho. This is a list of the members in the team. We're a fairly large group so we kind of split into two subgroups, and then the references here are at the bottom. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a well-timed presentation. Uh, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to leave it in the box here. Okay, so there's a question from Gabriel. Are these different models redundant or complementary? Okay, are these different models redundant? Uh, I would say that they are complementary. Um, anybody else in the group who wants to chime up can say that, but we are making sure that the, the base parameters that we're using are, are uh, the same, but, um, but I, I believe that they were, we're planning for them to be complementary. If anybody else in the group has something to add, please. Yeah, the survey will inform the ergum much more, and I think that the analytical equations um, you know, we're not going to be able to mimic the exact uh, variation of omega that we're putting in the analytical equations on the ergon side. So the adaptive rewiring on the ergon side is going to be more informed by the behaviors we get from the survey. Is the source available? Um, 
I don't know. <laughs> if somebody else in the groups knows if the source from, from one of the papers I recommended is available, let me know. Let them know. <laughs> uh, you mean source code? Oh, of our work. Um, we have a GitHub repo with, that has two forks, one for the Ergon side and one for the, uh, the um, ABM side. One, the Ergon side's in, in R, the Epi model. And I believe uh, if Patrick is managing that repo, so Patrick Kaminsky would be the person to find out how. I'm, I'm a pretty technically naive when it comes to managing GitHub and how things are, what's available and what's not. But um, we can chat afterwards. Yes, our repo is public. It's not public yet. Patrick has chimed in. He's managing it. So it's not public yet, but I don't imagine that, that we would uh, be keeping it private. For, okay. Yeah. So, so let's, let's wrap it up at that. Thank you so much again. Sure. Yeah. And um, next group, are you ready? Can you just... Okay. Alex, are you the screen sharer of the group? You guys can unmute yourself. Now you have co-host privileges. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, Eric, are you gonna share or do you want me to? Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, either is good. Okay. I can screen share. Um, All right, hi. Uh, today we're gonna to be talking about simplicial models of social contagion. We did a lot of this work based on a paper from Nature and we tried to just dive in and understand all of it. Next slide. So the structure of the paper, they dealt with some real simplicial complexes. They got a lot of data of people interacting and built simplicial complexes out of those. And then they did some synthetic simplicial complexes and a little bit of analytical analysis to try to understand kind of like how we have the dispersion R not plots they tried to understand how that works in this new setting all right next slide so for the motivation social distancing is an important aspect of pandemic control uh, as sam talked about today it's really important to understand not just r not but also group effects like dispersion and we need to understand how those model dynamics and social processes work with a more complex model because graphs don't really model anything more than just pairwise interactions. Um, so this is what led the team that published this paper to simplicial complexes. They're really good at modeling higher order effects. Next slide. So if you're familiar with hypergraphs at all, a simplicial complex is just a special case of a hypergraph that's closed under inclusion. So if we have some edge ABC, then all of the subsets are also edges or simplexes. Um, as you can see in figure A, uh, zero simplex is just a point, one simplex is a normal graph edge, two simplex is a triangle. Uh, for this paper, because of mathematical complications, they decided to just focus on uh, zero, one, and two simplexes. And when we say group effects uh, in figures C through H, what we're really talking about is if you're a susceptible agent on a triangle with two other infectious agents. Because if you're just with one agent or if there isn't that triangle between you, then we won't, wouldn't see that group effect come in. It's captured by pairwise effects. Uh, next slide. So I guess the first thing to talk about is where did these simplicial complexes come from? Uh, they were from a workplace, a conference, a hospital, and a high school. They used uh, video and stopped every 20 seconds, looked at who was interacting face-to-face, -face, and they did this for five minutes of footage. And to minimize finite effects, they chose the 20% of simplices with the highest frequency. For the synthetic simplexes, they created them to have statistical properties that were nice because they wanted to do some complex mean field analysis. Uh, so for all of them, 
there is 2,000 zero simplexes, which would be people in this model, and then KP, which is the pairwise uh, number of pairwise um, edges on average is 20, and then KD is the number of triangles incident on every edge on average. And go ahead and take it over, Eric. Yeah, sure. So then what they did is after uh, creating these real world networks or creating the synthetic networks, they ran a um, they ran an SIS model, so the susceptible infectious model um, on the networks. And to include group effects, they included an infection term also relating to if you're again in a simplex with two other infected individuals to account for variance in network structure. Uh, they looked at the effect of these rescaled parameters, um, these lambda j's, so lambda j at the pairwise level or lambda j at the two simplex level, the triangle level. Um, and then they did numeric results for the real world networks. I'll explain these graphs uh, in two slides. Uh, and then for the synthetic networks, they did both numeric results and an analytic analysis using this mean field approach. Um, so the main point about the mean field approach um, that I'll discuss in the next slide also is that it shows why you have, it gives evidence for why you have the dynamics that you observe in the numeric results. Um, and that relates to the stability and value of the fixed points of this mean field differential equation, which is saying that the rate of change of your density of infection is based off of the rate at which you um, recover and then the rates at which you get infected due to the likelihood of having either a non-infected and infected pair, or then two infected pairs and a non-infected, um, two non-infected nodes and an infected node in a triangle um, in the simplex. Um, and so then basically the main results are that in including these group effects, you get heuristic, um, or sorry, including these group effects, you get hysteresis loops in what they call a bistable region. And so the main thing is that um, is shown in this plot. Uh, first, you have the results for no group effects, which is this blue line. But then when you include group effects, uh, you see that there's a transition from the equilibrium solution being no infection to the endemic state. Um, and that gets pushed back farther as you include the group effects further. Um, and what that, is, what that is, is because in this mean field model, the stability of these fixed points changes. Um, so you get a stable fixed point when your lambda value is in a critical region and an unstable one, uh, which is this dotted line right here that separates um, whether you go to zero infection or whether you go to a positive state of infection uh, for equilibrium state. Uh, but then as you change further, the zero infection loses stability and you end up only going to this positive infective state. So including these group effects, you get these novel um, bistable region and hysteresis effects. Um, and then here, this is just showing that the mean field analysis of that stability matches well the numerical data for the synthetic networks. Um, this is just a phase diagram. That's basically the plot of one of the, um, one of the solutions with these two rescaled infectivity parameters. Yeah, so then conclusions that this simplicial model captures basic mechanism and effects of social contagion for certain phenomenon. Um, it's kind of a general robust phenomenology. So you can imagine including group effects like this instead of for SIS models, for SIR models, SEIR models, et cetera. And then future work, you could analyze um, what the further effect is of higher, including higher order simplices. Also, what are the effects of allowing dynamic network change, the dynamic network structure to change? Um, and yeah, steady behavior of more complex contagion processes. Um, so more analysis on heterogeneous or scale-free networks like those real world networks. Uh, if you're interested also, they cite references 58 to 62 of this paper uh, for different approaches related to the above ideas. Uh, thanks, I don't know if anybody has any ideas. Also, I think this is just a good visualization of the difference in statistical properties between the real world networks and the synthetic networks uh, that they create where these look very nice. Global connectivity can well approximate local connectivities, things average out um, versus the real world networks are on the whole more fat tailed. 
Thank you so much, Eric and Alex, for the talk. Uh, if anybody has a question, we have about a minute. So if they could type it in. Or if you, if uh, Alex and Eric, you have any comments to add um, to end, that would also be nice.